Alright, so you guys can see my you can see my um slides. Um I think. So okay, so yeah, we're gonna be talking about homotopy groups of spheres. And um so what precisely? So I'll give a little introduction, you know, what the idea is behind these homotopy groups of spheres. We'll see that they're somehow studying how spheres wrap around each other. Um, we'll see how to, how this, um, what this actually means. Um, and we'll look at some low dimensional examples. And the reason for this is they're the easiest to picture or visualize because, well, obviously they're low dimensional. So, um, so that, so we're working in dimensions that we're actually familiar with. Um, but then we'll, we'll up the dimensions. So we'll actually go up to four dimensions. Um, so as a warm up, we'll we'll try to visualize a four dimensional sphere, whatever that means, and and then after that, we'll look at a very special map in this subject called the Hopf vibration, and um, this tells us information about how four dimensional spheres can wrap around three dimensional spheres. So um, we'll, again, we'll see how that becomes precise and. Um, you know, in general, for this talk, we'll just keep going up and up in dimensions. So the idea of, so we're starting off with low dimensional examples. Then we're going up to, we're going up by one dimension to do the hop vibration and all of this stuff. And then we're going to go on to stable homotopy groups of spheres. And the whole idea between stable homotopy groups of spheres is that as you climb the dimensions up and up, so if we do we'll look at what these symbols mean, but as as n goes to infinity, then these homotopy groups should stabilize, which basically saying that um, um, as we go higher and higher in dimensions, you know, these groups should be the same, no matter what our n is, um, given n sufficiently large. And um, I will, to finish off, to wrap up, um, we'll look at further directions, so that is, how can we make this more formal, instead of just looking at pictures, what have mathematicians been working on to make progress on this, and then lastly, I don't actually know much about the applications, but I've linked a very good math overflow um, thread, which will hopefully spark some inspiration as to the applications within and outside of mathematics. Alright, so... As I was saying before, the problem of computing homotopy groups of spheres, which is just written like this, um, which is just written as pi n of sk, but this is just um, a homotopy group of the sphere. Um, it's quite an old one, it's quite classic. Um, it's probably been thought about since the 1920s, 1910s, 1930s, that type of area. <laughs> and um, what it does is it studies how spheres wrap around each other. So we'll look at, hopefully this will become more clear as to what that means when we look at the low dimensional examples. And um, for any of you who know what this means, it's it's precisely what it is, is pi n of sk is equal to homotopy classes of maps between the n sphere and the k sphere, which are based. But we don't need to know what this means. Um, we just need to understand the pictures. This is just precisely what the definition is, um, just in case you're wondering. Um, and, yeah, so in this talk, we'll talk about intuition, the basic concepts, and, um, yeah, hopefully it's at least somewhat intriguing. Um, Alright, so the first thing we're going to look at is this table. And... This table is a huge mess, right? Um, you know, we've got a bunch of cyclic groups all over the place. We've got products of a bunch of cyclic groups over here. And what this is, is, well, hopefully it's clear. It's pi, pi n along this column, this uh, row here, and different dimensional spheres along here. So, for example, if we were to look at this group here, what this is saying is that pi 6 of s4 is the integers mod 2. So, alright, so that's what this table is telling us. 
there are obviously some patterns here. It would be very, it would be annoying <laughs> if there weren't patterns. So firstly, we've got these integers along this diagonal. All along this diagonal, we have the integers. So what is this telling us? Well, this is pi 1 of s1 is the integers. Pi 2 of s2, if you go down. Pi 3 of s3. You've got pi 4 of s4, and so on and so on. So it turns out that pi n of sn is the integers. So that's our first pattern, that's the first thing we can see. Maybe, maybe, maybe not, maybe that's not the first thing so Maybe the first thing you see in terms of patterns is um, all of these zeros here. All of these zeros here. I'm not going to draw that line because I don't trust my line drawing skills, but those zeros there. So that is pi 1 of the circle, s1, are the integers, but then pi n, so as soon as 1, as soon as we get bigger than 1, pi n of the circle seem to be 0, right? There's no other group here at all, and that's true when uh, n is bigger than 1. Um, so that's another pattern you might see, and of, and the homotopy groups of the zero sphere are trivial, but the zero sphere is not interesting anyway for this talk at least. But okay, now there are some more. There are more. There are some more subtle ones too. A really interesting one, and maybe something that will surprise you, is actually if we take a look at this row from here to here, these two rows are identical. Look, we have the integers, the integers, the integers more 2, integers more 2, more 2, more 2, more 12, more 12, more 2, more 2, more 2, more 2, more 3, more 3, more 15, more 15. You see? So these two rows, when n is bigger than 3, turns out that the, the sphere, like an ordinary sphere, and a four-dimensional sphere have identical homotopy groups. Um, most of these groups are finite, right? So, so another question would be, so obviously some of them, for the example, this group isn't, fi is infinite, this is infinite, for example, um, this is an infinite group here, but of course the majority of the groups are either trivial, you know, that's technically finite, or we have the integers mod 2, you know, mod 15, so most of them are finite, but some of them aren't. And actually, recently, well not recently, but you know, in the 60s or 70s or something, Serre showed that the only infinite homotopy groups of spheres are pi n of the sphere, which we saw earlier, which is just this row, but also pi 4n minus 1 of the 2n sphere. This is also always going to be infinite. So that's a really strange pattern. Let's see where these these groups land actually on this table. So when n equals 1, this is pi 3 of the 2 sphere, okay? When n equals 2, this is pi 7 of s4, right here. When n equals 3, we get pi 11 of the 6 sphere. When n equals 4, we get pi 15 of the 8 sphere, which is also infinite, and so on and so on and so on. So we also get this diagonal here, kind of, which you can sort of see now, of infinite groups among amongst all of these, you know, finite groups. And these are just some of the patterns that one can see. I won't go through more, but, you know, just to give you an idea, just to give a little tease of just how, you know, crazy these groups are. They're, they seem really random. And, you know, it's a classic problem of computing them. That's why there's no closed form for them yet. Um, but, yeah. All right. Let's see. So, now we'll look at some low-dimensional examples. So, firstly, the fundamental group of the circle. So, this is, this one here suggests that we're wrapping one, so S1, which is just the circle, Around, well, what's in here? 
the circle. So we're wrapping the circle around itself. Now how this can be visualised is as wrapping a rubber band around a glue stick. So the glue stick is the circle that's being wrapped around, and the rubber band is the circle that's actually doing the wrapping. So, of course, if we have a, a glue stick here, which we'll do in this dark blue, and we have a rubber band, we can wrap it around once. We can do it twice. We can do it thrice and so on and so on, but also, um, if we do it, if we do something like this, plus one, then what's minus one going to be, it's just going to be wrapping it anti-clockwise, so that's minus one, so that's where the integers come in, so actually, turns out that if you wrap the sphere around itself, I mean the circle, sorry that's really chunky, um, if you wrap the circle around itself, mod modulo homo's hobby at least, we get the pi 1 of s1 are the integers, because you can just wrap the circle once, we can go twice, but then also, that okay, so that's the, so 0, is doing nothing, 1 going around once, 2 going around 2, minus 1 is going um, anti-clockwise, right? So that's what minus 1 is, and minus 2 is going around anti-clockwise twice, so eventually we get the integers, and um, actually, surprisingly, this fact here as just a side note, um, not important to the talk, but interestingly, this can be used to show, of all things, the fundamental theorem of algebra. So this fact that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers can actually be used to show that all um, polynomials of degree n with coefficients in the complex numbers have at, at most n roots within within the complex numbers so you know um this fact actually is useful at, even though the connection if the connection is obvious to you then that's very impressive but you know the connection is not clear at all but it, it can be used to show this so you know there we go that's an unexpected application perhaps now we have the fundamental group of the sphere this is where it gets a bit more interesting. So let's say we have a sphere. Um, how do we wrap a circle around a sphere? So let's say we have a circle um, here. We can... This is a terrible drawing, so I'm not going to attempt to draw. Um, but what it can be... So if you have a globe in your room, um, or something spherical, even a football will suffice. Um, if you take a rubber band and wrap it around that circle, uh, or just like put it on that, or not that circle, put it on that sphere, then you'll notice that you can always just, what can you do? You can always um, do this, basically. I, I've, I've lost the word, but we can always go and shrink it down to a point like this. So you can always, um, what's the word, um, take it off, um, without doing, we can just continuously take it off without cutting the rubber band itself, so you don't need to use scissors to take off, assuming no friction of course, which we are right now, um, obviously there would be physical factors like friction which would, which might slow you down or whatever, but you don't need to cut the rubber band or do anything special to it to just continuously take it off. And that's why the fundamental group or the ways you can wrap the circle around the sphere is zero. Because any way that we put the circle on the sphere can be 
homotopically shrunk down to a point, which means basically we don't need to do any cutting or ripping or anything to just shrink this circle down to a point on this on this globe. Okay. Now the second homotopy group of the sphere is quite interesting. Um so let's say that your friend likes football and it's his birthday, so you get him a football for his birthday, and you wrap you're wrapping the football. But okay, here's where things get a bit abstract. This wrapping paper that you're using is quite special. When the inside of the wrapping paper touches itself, the wrapping paper dissolves. So that's what's special about this wrapping paper. So, you know, if you to, well, yeah, if you let the insides touch, the wrapping paper just goes poof, dissolves. So, okay, this doesn't stop us from wrapping the football, right? Because then, because when you wrap it any amount of times, it's just going to be the inside and the outside that touches. Um, the reason that the fun that the fundamental the second homotopy group of the sphere. So this is um, wrapping spheres around spheres. Um, now the reason that the fun the second homotopy group of the sphere is the integers is that he can't just so in in the example before when we got when we did this we didn't need to do any dissolving we didn't need to do anything to this circle at all to be able to continuously shrink it to a point however with this example we have to the friend has to dissolve each layer so he has to make the insides touch he can't just continuously take off the wrapping paper without cutting it or doing anything like that. He has to make the insides touch. And that's what the negative part is. So the positive part of the integers just corresponds to wrapping the, the sphere around itself n amount of times, and the negative branch of the integers just corresponds to undoing or dissolving the wrapping paper. Um, and this number here, so this wrap one, wrap zero, is actually called the winding number. Um, just a just a fact. Um, okay, so hopefully you're starting to get the hang of this now. You're starting to see. Okay, that's how spheres wrap around each other. Um, but surely at this point you might be thinking, well, our intuition is suggesting that pi n of s n is equal to the integers as we saw above right okay that's good but the problem is that pi n of s k so far is zero when k is not equal to n that's not true that's what mathematicians thought but obviously they were wrong because homotopy groups are really sneaky um and actually this example doesn't change this but the fact that it's so hard to explain why this example is not changing it is a good is is a sign of hope, right? So the second homotopy group of the circle, this is trivial, um, and we're wrapping a sphere a sphere around a circle. So this time. Imagine that, I don't know, um, your friend likes jewellery at now, so you're getting him a ring for his birthday. So now we're wrapping a ring. The problem is, this time, when the friend receives the ring, he can continuously take off the wrapping paper without dissolving it, without cutting it, without doing anything to it. He can just take it off. And I don't have a reasonable explanation for why this is, um, but that's what this fact here is actually saying. Um, so let's take a look at a picture. Um, we've got our sphere and we've got our circle. But we can actually just shrink this sphere, which is wrapped around the circle. This image isn't very clear, but we can shrink it down to a point. Um, and up to homotopy. 
which is what we care about. This this example is general. Um, okay. So, all right, I'll stop here if you have any questions about that, um, about those four examples, because um, now things are going to get a little bit more complicated because we're actually going to move up in dimensions. Um, so, yeah, um, I'll just quickly... Oh, look, we've got a decent turnout now. Um, all right, so... Anyway, so uh, this seems to just be a GIF, Trivial, and LOL what, so I'll take that as no questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you don't have any questions, then voice them. Um, um, because, yeah, we're actually going to go up in dimensions now, so um, things are going to get a little bit more trippy than before. Um, but then just wrapping ordinary spheres around ordinary spheres or ordinary circles around ordinary spheres. Now we're going to use four dimensional spheres. So if you have any issues, then, um, yeah, okay. But so far, so good is what I'm taking the silence as. All right. So as a warm up for visualizing, so our goal in this mini little section to visualize S3, which is four dimensional, which is what I'm saying here. Um, so that's our goal. But firstly, we'll use a technique which works for lower dimensional spheres. And then hopefully you'll see how it allows us to also see the four dimensional sphere. So. A two sphere, that's just a regular sphere. And the equation for it is x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to one. That's the equation for a sphere of radius one. Now we can rearrange this to x squared plus y squared is equal to one minus z squared. And we'll call z t, we'll call z time for now. Um, so it's time. Uh, whoops, I went on to rubber. Okay, here we go, yeah. So, T. That's a not so bright. Okay, T. But, recall this. A circle of radius R is X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared. But what do we have here? x squared plus y squared is equal to something. So this is just a family of circles of radius square root of 1 minus t squared. That's just so the sphere can be thought of as a family of circles which have this radius of square root of 1 minus t squared. Um, and t is varying between negative 1 and 1. Hopefully that's clear. So let's see an image. Hopefully the image makes that clear. Let's see. So, let's do some annotation here. We have the equator. Actually, we'll draw... Okay. So the equator is somewhere around here. It's unclear on this image exactly where it is. But the equator is when t is equal to 0. So that is, we have x squared plus y squared is equal to 1. So we just have a regular circle in the middle of the sphere. Um, by the way, t is the z-axis, so it's how high or low we are. Um, so that's along here. Now on the top, this top point here, this one t is equal to 1. So we have x squared plus y squared is equal to 0. Or just a point. It's just when x and y are equal to zero. And similarly is the case at the bottom somewhere when t is negative one. And so on and so on and so on. So when you glue them all together in this way, we get a sphere. And um, this doesn't just work for a normal sphere. This also works for a circle. So we'll just skip straight to the image this time. Um, a circle is actually just a bunch of zero spheres stuck together. So, a zero sphere is just, um, we have a number line, and we have 
a couple of points. So, we have when t equals 0 now, and um, this is just going to be x squared is equal to some r, right? Um, so, when, 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 so we get, when we rearrange the circle equation to be 1 minus t squared, we're obviously getting, um, we're getting our equation for the zero sphere back. Um, this should not be a plus, that should be an x squared equals 1 minus t squared. Um, we're getting our equation for the zero sphere back. And you know, we have a zero sphere here, when t is equal to zero, we have another zero sphere here, and we have a lot of mini zero spheres, all glued together, like so. Okay, now, hopefully with this intuition out the way, we can kind of see, I'm not, I don't know what I'm supposed to say here, but we can hopefully kind of see how we have small sphere here, we have a big sphere, you know, like here or whatever, and they're all glued together in a fourth dimension. So this is one way of visualizing the four sphere, and it's the way that I find nicest. Um, so this is our glorious image here. So hopefully, that kind of makes some sense with the previous explanation as to how a four sphere is just a family of normal spheres um, just getting bigger or smaller. And so, I don't even want to imagine what a 5-sphere is, which is just going to be a bunch of 4-spheres, which are bigger or smaller. Um, but anyway, we shall proceed. Okay. Now we get on to something really important, called the hop vibration. And the hop vibration is an interesting map between the 3-sphere... So what we just saw before, to the 2-sphere. This is what it is, it's a map between, between, um, this, and a normal sphere, somehow. And, um, yeah, so this is somehow wrapping the 3-sphere around the 2-sphere. And, um, I know that someone who's not here now in the talk, but they asked, how can this stuff can this stuff be used anywhere in physics or engineering or whatever? Um, one of my physicist friends, who's actually appeared on the channel, C. Furco, said that the hot vibration models a particle carrying magnetic charge. So, there you go. There is application here. Um, don't ask me about this, though, because I have no idea how this is true. Um, but, yeah. Um, that is true. Um, and... Um, it models a particle carrying magnetic charge. And um, what's so interesting about the hop vibration is that it was used in ways we will not discuss today to show that pi 3 of s2 is not zero, it's the integers. Right? So our early intuition kind of breaks down that pi k of sn is, not e is equal to zero for k not equal to n. So that breaks down at this point. And Heinz Hopf showed why um, in the early 1930s, I believe. So, okay, so we're mapping the 3-sphere to the 2-sphere. But actually, okay, so let's say we have some map eta, which we'll call the hop vibration. Then what we're really going to look at here is Eta, I, I, I don't want to say inverse, but the pre-image of eta. So what happens, so really, what we should be asking is, what happens to things on the three-sphere, and where do they get put on the, on the two-sphere? But what we're going to say is, what happens to points on the two-sphere? So a point on the two-sphere corresponds to a circle here. So... The equator, I think I've got another, yeah. So the equator, so all of the points that form an equator, correspond 
to a torus that you can flip upside down. And thankfully I have an image here because this is what that will look like. So if you have our map Ada inverse or the pre-image of Ada from S2 to S3, then points, collection of points, um, maps to the circle. Okay, so that's what's happening here and here. So the colors make it clear which ones correspond to which circle here. So, you know, we have a pink point here, which kind of corresponds to this pinkish circle here and whatever. Um, okay, good, good. So now if we have multiple circles, so... Yeah, okay. So if the fibers, so the points on the sphere are called fibers. So now if we say, well, what if we have multiple points which kind of make up circles? Well, then we'll get what, hopefully, what we might expect. So if one circle along the equator makes a torus, then multiple circles make three, make linked tori, which hopefully makes sense. And already this is looking quite cool. So this corresponds to this. Okay, now let's see, what if the fibres form an arc, so what if they're all tightly packed together like this, so what if the points on the sphere form an arc, then, Ada inverse from S2 to S3, so if you have a collection of points, all linked together, this maps to, well, that. And what that is, is a hop flink, and it's an annulus whose boundary circles are linked. So what? Is, so it's basically something that looks like this. So it's an annulus whose boundary circles are linked. And hopefully even here you can see the boundary circles. And don't forget that we're getting circles because these are still fibres. So fibres, so points on the sphere, are going to map to circles on the three sphere. And so, basically what we're asking is, when the fibres are linked, so when we get multiple points joined together, how do the circles join together on the three sphere? And they form what's called a hop flink, which looks like this. And so now, the final image, and I don't know how many people might have seen this image before, but if you have seen this image, then it, you'll immediately recognise it, or if you've seen anything similar to this is this image here. And all this is, all this image here is, this is just, it's just the image of the, pr it's just the pre-image of a bunch, so we've got a ton of links here, we've got the fibres forming an arc, we've got three arcs, and we've got a bunch of um, hop links all linked together, and it and one of the reasons why the hop vibration is famous is not just because it managed to disprove mathematicians and so forth that homotopic groups of spheres would be simple, but also it it just looks really cool when you visualize it in this way. Um, so these are fibers that form a lot of links, and yeah, there's the typical image. Um, there. Okay, so, I don't know, if someone could unmute and kind of just say yes or no as to whether you want sort of a little side note on why the hop vibration is technically advantageous, or like, you know, why, why this is actually useful in the problem of, so why this is useful in pi n of sk. Um, or if you just want me to move on. Um, if someone could just unmute and kind of say... Um, it, I, I don't know what I'll take silence as. I'll take silence as a yes, but, you know, I'd rather someone just unmute and say yes or no to me. Wait, I'm just going to check if I actually have any people. Um, yeah, I do still have people here. So, okay, I'm just going to check chat here. 
Um, yes or no to the more technical slide. I don't mind. All right. Yes. Okay. There we go. Um, let me just mark these pings as red, just in case you actually have pings. Um, oh god. Uh, where am I now? Okay. There we go. Yeah. All right. So. Yes. Yeah, so. Okay. So. The hop vibration, well, why is it called a vibration? Why is it not just called the hop map, for example? Um, and the reason for this is that, well, it's a vibration. So, this means that it satisfies the technical property about some commutative diagram, which we don't need to know about, and that it's a surjection. So, our map eta from S3 to the two sphere is a surjection. And so that means that it'll map something on the three sphere to something on the two sphere and everything on the two sphere will be covered. Um, but that was a bad explanation of what a surjection is, but hopefully you know what a surjection is but, um, already. But what does it mean for it to be a vibration? So it's a vibration and the interesting part is that the fiber is a circle and this is rare. Vibrations with only spheres are rare. In fact, there are only three of them. No, four of them. There's only four. And they're really useful. So, the four, the four are, let's just go over what the four are. Um, they are this one here, this one isn't really important because the homotopy groups of all of the, these two spheres are already known. We have our hop vibration, which we just looked at. We have a vibration of the form, so we have it going from S7 to S4, and we've got an S3 here. And finally, we have one which is. Um, S, what is it, S15, I believe, um, yeah, I think it's S15, sorry, no, it's not, sorry, um, what is it now, um, sorry, no, it's not S15, it's S8, mapping to S, um, Sorry, um, I've just got a little bit mixed up here. Um, I forget what the last one is. It's just slipping my mind. I'm just having a little bit of a brain fart. But okay, we've got four of them, and three of three of them are here. So what's advantage? What's good about having these? So let's restrict our attention right now. Um, to. Um, the one which we were looking at before. This one. Actually, no, those were the only three. Yeah, those. the reason why I couldn't think of the other one is because those were the only three. Yeah, yeah, okay, there we go. Um, so let's look at, let's restrict our attention to this one. What's so advantageous about having this is that we get a long exact sequence um, of homotopy groups. So this induces... A long exact sequence of homotopy groups, which looks like uh, pi m minus one s one pi n minus one s three, so on, so on. Um, okay. And so, yeah, so, sorry, no, this should be a, uh, uh, yeah, so we have this. And the good thing is that, um, what's the good thing here? Yeah, the good thing here is that this map, so this inclusion is, it, because, because the, higher homotopy groups of the circle are zero, this inclusion here 
induces is just a zero map. So the induce map here is just a zero map. So actually, what this does is it splits nicely into short exact sequences. And these short exact sequences are actually split short exact sequences. So that in the end, we end up with short exact sequences that look like um, pi n. Sorry, uh, yeah, pi n of s uh, 1 to pi n of s 3 to pi n minus 1 of s 2 to 0. So because this splits, we get that pi n of s 3 is, ah, sorry, my bad, my bad, my bad, um, this should be an n minus 1, yeah, okay, alright, um, um, sorry, yeah, okay, I think this is what it will look like, and so, let's just see if this gives us the right result, um, it's isomorphic to, pi n minus 1 of s1 plus pi n of s2. Is that, is that right? No, we should be getting, no, it's the other way, it's the other way around, isn't it? No. <laughs> Sorry, um, I'm just trying to, in, there's an n minus 1 somewhere, and basically, basically what we want to get is, what's true is that Earlier on, is really early, when we looked at that table, we saw that pi n of s3 was the same thing as pi n of s2 when n was bigger than or equal to 3. And the hop vibration is the way that we get to show this. Um, if my brain decided to function... Um, um, but this is giving us something completely false, so I'm just going to remove this because um, I can't seem to remember precisely what it was. It was, um, so let's see, um, no, it was pi n of s2 here, yeah, okay, that's what it was. Okay, pi n of s2 is isomorphic to pi n minus 1 of s1 plus pi n of s3 yeah this is what it was there we go yeah that's it yeah um so this split short exact sequence just written wrongly um but anyway we get this um i'm sure that the viewer will be able to slow down and precisely determine how the short exact sequence breaks down but we get this but remember before that pi n of s1 is equal to 0 for n bigger than 1. So, when, um, when n is bigger than 1, wait, sorry, yeah, okay, so then when n is bigger than 2, yeah, because we have n minus 1 there, so when n is bigger than 2, we get that pi n of s2 is isomorphic to just 0 plus a pi n of s3. Yeah, there we go, yeah. And then obviously when you just do the trivial group direct sum with something non something, that's just going to give you that something back. So overall we get pi n of s3, yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> that took me a while, but in the end it was worth it, right? For n bigger than 2. And to emphasise, this is because this right here, when n is bigger than 2, is going to be trivial. And that's why. Okay, yeah, I got there in the end. So that's the technical advantage. We managed to obtain this isomorphism here. And so, we're not done quite yet, because we know that pi n of Sn is isomorphic to the integers. 
So, we get that pi 3, so when we put in, so when n equals 3, uh, 3 is bigger than 2, so we know that pi 3 of s2 must be pi 3 of s3, but then this, by this theorem here, is integers, and so we use the hop vibration to show that pi 3 of s2 is isomorphic to the integers, which is pretty cool. And you can use the higher ones, with the higher one which I said with the 7 sphere and so forth, to show that, you know, you have a similar thing with, um, with other spheres, you have a different um, splitting or whatever. Um, I don't precisely remember how that one goes. Um, but yeah, so there, there are a lot of advantages to using vibrations, which is why, um, you know, long exact sequences are so important or whatever. Okay, so that was a little bit messy, but hopefully you get the idea that, in the end, so, okay, I'll summarise it, just because that was a little bit messy, I didn't have anything prepared for that. So, vibrations, um, induce a long exact sequence on homotopy groups. Um, so... For the hop vibration, this, this, the long exact sequence induced split short exact sequences. And this manages to give us isomorphisms so we can, gives us isomorphisms between um, homotopy groups of spheres, Sn, and other ones. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm saying here is that the short, split short exact sequences manage to give us our desired result of pi n of S3 and pi n of S2. Okay, so that conclusion hopefully clears up what was a bit of a messy and a bit of a roller coaster ride for me. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that was a little bit confusing, maybe, I don't know. Um, so I'll just pause here if there are any lingering questions. Um, no, I'll, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry if that was, sorry if that, um, slide I didn't explain that very well, um, but hopefully you kind of get the idea that the hop vibration, um, induces a long exact sequence, which then gives us information about homotopy groups of spheres, which is basically what I was trying to convey there, but more technically. Um, I'll wait for, I'll, I'll wait for another, I don't know, 20 or so seconds, and if no one unmutes, um, I'll just proceed. Um, all right, I'll just I'll just go on, and um, if you have any questions, um, then yeah, okay. Oh, this is a fun part: stable homotopy groups of spheres. Yes, I like this. All right, so what's the idea behind this stuff? This is that the homotopy groups of spheres do stabilize, and what this means is that for pi n plus k of Sn, as n tends towards infinity, so as n gets bigger and bigger, then eventually we'll just get that they're all going to be the same. So when n is sufficiently large, n doesn't even matter, is basically what it is. And we'll see a concrete example of this. And this is a special case of the Freudenthal Suspension Theorem, which is basically saying this, but in general for homotopy groups, they stabilise. But we'll only look at this for spheres. So, we don't need to know what this homomorphism actually is. It's called the suspension homomorphism. And what it does is, it takes in pi n plus k of sk, 
sorry, of Sn. So it takes in a homotopy group of a sphere, and what it does is it ups the dimension by one of the sphere that we're that we're wrapping around, but it also ups the dimension of the sphere that's being wrapped around by one two. And it's denoted by sigma, and it's called the suspension homomorphism. What's interesting about this is that it's an isomorphism for n bigger than or equal to k plus 2. So let's just plug in n equals k plus 2. So that is k plus k, so 2k plus 2 of s k plus 2 is the same thing as pi 2k plus 3 of s k plus 3. So those are the exact same thing. So when, so when k, and then again, and then again, we get this, so this works further, pi 2k plus 4, and s k plus 4, and so on and so on. So these, you can somehow see this stable phenomenon occurring. So let's look at a concrete example. When k equals to 1, they stabilize for n bigger than or equal to, so they stabilize when n is bigger than or equal to 3. That's when it stabilizes. So we get that isomorphism. Okay. Okay. So they're more well studied because they're more well behaved, so they're a bit easier to study because they're actually stable. Um, and I'll try to. I I have a video on my channel and a talk which is somewhere on my blog, which you might be able to find if you do enough digging, um, where I prove that the fourth homotopy group of the three sphere is the integers mod two. Um, and I proved that rigorously with spectral sequences. But here, I'll try to prove this pictorially, or kind of by waving my hands a little bit, to show that it's, in, it's isomorphic to the integers mod 2. So, let's do a warm-up. So since we're dealing with pi n plus 1 of Sn, let's deal with something we already know, pi 3 of S2. I never really gave intuition as to why this is isomorphic to the integers. I just kind of used the hot vibration earlier to rigorously prove it. But here we'll give intuition as a warm up for why when we get bigger th dimensions than this, we're only going to get the integers mod 2. Let's see. So, we use something called the Hopf invariant to keep track of a homotopy class of a map from S3 to S2. You don't need to know what a homotopy class is, it's just keeping track of the elements of pi 3 of S2. Let's see how to compute it. So let's see, so most points P in S2, so if we just have a sphere, and we pick a point P on it, it has the property that the points X in the 3 sphere so the points in the 3 sphere, um, so that f of x is equal to p, where f is just some function between s3 and s2, most points p have the property that these points x, so that basically x is equal to the pre-image of, of p under f, form a bunch of knots in s3. And we can think of this as a link. Now, what you do is you pick two different points on S2. And those two points determine an integer called the Hopf invariant. What, it, what the Hopf invariant is counting, what the Hopf invariant is, it's an integer, right? And what it counts is, it counts the amount of times that the links overlap. With appropriate signs, I don't think, that, let's just scribble this out because I don't think this is actually accurate. Um, but basically we have appropriate signs. Um, and it counts the amount of times that the links overlap. Now this number 
What's important here is that the number doesn't depend on the two points. The only thing it depends on is the homotopy class of f. So the homotopy class of f corresponds to some Hopf invariant. So the collection of such things, this, this collection of homotopy classes is precisely pi 3 of S2 by definition, and the Hopf invariants are in bijection with the integers. So overall, we get that the integers are in bijection with pi 3 of S2, because there's this integer which keeps track of the homotopy class of F, and it's in by and and so because it only depends on the homotopy class of f, then it must be that each f determines a, a unique Hopf invariant up to homotopy classes. But then the collection of homotopy classes. Don't forget our definition, which is just pi n of S k is homotopy classes of maps between S n and S k. So the set of all such homotopy classes is precisely pi 3 of s2, and the Hopf invariant is obviously in bijection with the integers. Now the punchline, the punchline here is that in higher dimensions, links can be undone. So let's see what we're talking about. So say we if we lived in two dimensions, oh god that's terrible, that's really slanted, okay. Let's say that we live in two dimensions, then say we're a person, here, and say there's a line here. Let's actually draw this line um, um, in red, right? We can't get we got we can't get past that barrier in two dimensions because we don't have the option to go up because that's a third dimension thing. So we're just stuck there. However, in three dimensions, obviously we can just go over it. In the same way, links that we can't undo normally in three dimensions, well, we can just undo them in four dimensions. I like to think of this as having extra room. We have an extra dimension to work with. And so a link, which normally couldn't be undone in three dimensions without cutting it or whatever, can be undone in four dimensions. So, our link counter. So say we have a link um, that looks something like, let's say we have a something like this. This can be undone. This just corresponds to a couple of lines now. And so the Hopf invariant before, which would count the amount of times that the links overlap, now it's only defined mod 2, because, because we can undo these links so easily. And the same reasoning, as we go up and up in dimensions, that's not going to change. We're not going to suddenly be able to not undo links in, like, the 68th, 69th dimension, right? We're going we're gonna to be able to undo links, even as we climb higher and higher in dimensions. And so that hopefully demonstrates how as we climb in dimensions, as we get more and more wiggle room, eventually the homotopy groups of spheres, they're all going to be the same. They're all going to stabilise eventually. And so, yeah, um, I'll wait here if there are any questions. Again, do unmute if you have any questions. Because the, the last part is really just, you know, uh, kind of wrapping up. You know, this is just wrap up kind of looking at more rigorous further dimensions, but the main bulk of the talk, the main part which I wanted to do, is finished now. Um, so if you have any questions, do unmute and voice them now. Alright, good. So, yeah, the final remarks are just some further directions and some applications. And um, after the talk, after I stop recording, you know, we can, you know, if you want, we can discuss the, the thing which I linked in the slides. Um, 
Alright, so the first one is spectral sequences. These are something that I'm a fan of myself. Um, and they are a really powerful algebraic gadget. They're purely algebraically defined, really, from a homological algebra standpoint. And they are, well, they're not purely algebraic, but, you know, they're an algebraic gadget in nature, I would argue, that have been used with great effect to yield homotopic groups of spheres. So originally they were do they were um they were brought into place in order to compute homology groups. But okay, there's so much interplay between homotopy and homology that it was inevitable that th that such a powerful tool for computing cohomology and homology was eventually going to be able to be used for homotopy groups as well. So that's one way. And um, an example is that with the Seri spectral sequence, is ab we are able to compute pi 4 of S3. So that's very efficiently done with the Seri spectral sequence, for example. Another way is bordism. Now, bordism is something that I'm not too familiar with, but here's how I think that the story kind of goes. So Thom, the main b players are Thom and uh, Pontra. Uh, yeah, th these two guys. <laughs> uh, so, in the 1950s, this guy here, he showed that the nth framed cobordism group, which is basically just the main... So, in a homotopy group, we study homotopy groups. Sorry. In a homotopy theory, we study homotopy groups. I think in cobordism, we study framed cobordism groups. And framed cobordism group of certain smooth manifolds were precisely the nth stable homotopy group of spheres. So that was a very geometric interpretation of homotopy groups of spheres in the 1950s. Soon after that, so I think in 1954 it was, Thom, he came along and generalized it using Thom spaces, and now it's known as something known as um, Thom Pontragian construction. And actually, there have been further results recently which generalize this construction even further, but that's really like uncharted territory for me, so you know, okay, um, that's that really. There's also something called the J homomorphism, and this is a morphism between a homotopy group of orthogonal groups and homotopy groups of spheres. So the way that I like to think of this is comparing homotopy groups of spheres to homotopy groups of something else, maybe more well understood. And again, actually, um, if I may just give an example, is that when I equals 1, J is an isomorphism. So this is another way of doing um, homotopy groups of spheres um, for i equals 1 for pi m plus 1 of Sn. So um, Adam's approach. So the main goal, the main thing that people like to do is to look at this J homomorphism, which is for all i, it's not a, it's not always going to be an isomorphism, of course, but it's an interesting morphism, which is defined in a few different ways. But obviously the image of it is going to be some subset of, or maybe it's just going to be precisely homotopy groups of spheres. So obviously the image is going to be very important. So if you could develop tools for studying the image of this homomorphism, then, you know, we're studying homotopy groups of spheres. And Adams used K-theory, which is a very sophisticated field of mathematics, to determine the image of it. And it's now, of course, you know, given us more information about how to use it. And what good is all this? Well, after I've stopped recording, we can go to this um, link here. And, um, you know, I'll put, I'll, I'll put the notes in a blog post for those of you watching on YouTube, um, so you can click on this link too. Um, and, you know, this outlines various applications of this. And yeah, that's it. So, um, thank you to those who are still here.
listening to me on the Discord server, and um, thank you to those on YouTube who are also watching this. Um, I'm just going to stop recording and then we can discuss further. Alright.